Now then, is the media guilty of mythologising Raoul Moat? The 37-year-old bouncer was the focus of a massive manhunt, what, six weeks ago? After shooting and seriously wounding his ex-partner, Samantha Stobart, a killing her new boyfriend, Chris Brown, and then blinding a policeman, David Rathband, in that case, for absolutely no reason whatsoever. He then went on the run for a week before turning the gun on himself, like a real hero. Well, last night, Channel 4 tried to explain Moat's actions, playing us recordings he'd made over a number of years, which the Channel claimed detailed his struggle with his mental health and how much he hated the police. OK, now, you could argue the documentary explained why Moat did what he did, but what it didn't explain is why so many people worship this muscle-bound nutcase. The tributes left at the site where he died, the dozens who turned up at his funeral, despite the fact they'd never even met him. And these included Theresa Bystrom, who travelled to Northumberland from Surrey and declared his funeral a better day out than Legoland. I've never been to Legoland, I wouldn't know. But she's not the only one. Others have been taking their kids with them to visit the site. Now, what I want to know is, who turned Moat into a hero? Was it the rolling news coverage? Did they make it seem like it was moat against the world? Uh, what about the mass coverage in some of the red tops? As I said, he's been front page news almost every day this week in the sun, and this is six weeks after he died. Maybe, maybe it's got nothing to do with the media at all. It's just that some of us, a lot of us, have a, a, a warped view of what makes a hero or anti-hero. Is moat going to be celebrated in the same way as some celebrate Ronnie Biggs or Charles Bronson? Though neither of those two have murdered. So what is going on? Why do some people see Moat as a gallant warrior, I wonder, Angelica? Why? I have no idea. I've, this story really <coughs> confuses me, actually. I mean, I did, when, when this all happened, I just was quite appalled by it, and that was that. He killed people, you know, he shot himself. Done. This just... Then the police couldn't find him, and that's suddenly created television interest. Yeah, didn't I it? think it became, a, you know, a massive drama. You know, everyone was watching it. It was like, oh my gosh. I don't think the media. I mean, the question is, is the media making him a hero? I don't think necessarily that's the case because they print what people are interested about. This, you know, so even I would like, oh gosh, what's going on now? You mm -hmm. know, you, people want to find out what's going on, but I think there are just some people who just a transfix... It's like people who read novels on Jack the Ripper and, you know, serial killers you, you and stuff like that. You might be interested in something, but you wouldn't come around and say, Jack the Ripper, what a great guy, didn't he, didn't he treat women well, right? But no, isn't there that, that you, warped thing no about how, some people... But no matter how interested you are, at what point did Raoul Moat ever demonstrate the qualities of a gallant warrior? He, he hasn't. I, for me, he's just... I don't know. I think, just... I think there are a couple of issues here. I think it's... it's a, one, I, I think... Britain, ha the media industry, we call it an industry because it's there, it's, it, it acts as an industry, it hasn't it had, industry. hasn't had an American style event. You know, you watch these programs on certain channels and it's, you know, big helicopters chasing, they, they fuel the story with incredible drama, with music and things We've like that. We've had a few. And Remember, this is just a couple of weeks before this, we had Derek Bird exactly, going I'm around. Today, today is the anniversary of Hungerford. Yeah. yeah. I mean, exactly. it's not like, you know, it's not like they don't happen here. I think it was milked out of proportion, but it, but it got to that... It's that strange thing. I think there's a real sickness in society that, read, you know, that could support that kind of behaviour. I think, that having watched the documentary, um, there was a definition of hero. I don't know what the textbook is, but here, a hero is somebody who contributes goodness into the world, an act of goodness. Mm. Now, from the documentary, what I could see, what there was, there was nothing that he did that was good in his life, which then reflects, that makes me wonder about the sickness of the society that we live in that could think that this guy, this bully, this terroriser, but it's a horrible, horrible, yeah, horrible but, thing. But could do. It could become a, a hero. You say there's twenty thousand. How many people? There's about twenty four thousand. Twenty four thousand. Just before we started is, the show. You know, I don't think we have a society generally that of sick people. There's a lot of good people in society who care a lot about people. Care a lot about the victims. You know, from this case, I think it's a small minority of people who. That's a lot of people. And there's dozens no, of sites. But I'm, I'm, yeah, but I'm not. Mm. Set, what I'm trying to say is, there are still a lot of good people around who care about the victims. But there's a small amount of people in society who are fascinated by this and, you know, have a different way of thinking. I, okay. That's basically okay. what, what I think. Now, Steve, mm. uh, Ronnie Biggs, I can understand why people kind of worship Ronnie Biggs, because although it's been suggested at times that he might have coshed Jack Mills, the train driver, or train conductor, that he never killed anybody, he, he kind of got away with it, escaped from prison, was this sort of outlaw 
in a kind of romantic sense of the word, and people romanticised what was going on. But I can't understand how you can romanticise someone who shoots his girlfriend and nearly kills her, kills her boyfriend because he's jealous and he can't handle it, which just shows what an insignificant little twerp he was, and then goes around gunning down a copper who he doesn't even know. There's nothing romantic about that. Of course not. I mean, I, I totally agree with what, what you were just saying, really, that, that it, this isn't society that's condoning this or that's turning Moat into a hero. It's individuals, individuals who ha have a, a slightly sinister side in their brain that, that changes that fascination with someone who is... I mean, we, we have a kind of, of, of a culture that eulogises the Butch Cassidy and the Sundance yep. Kid, you know, the, the lovable rogues who go out there and they, they might kill people, yeah, sure, but they're good old guys who are bucking the system. That's very true. And, and so, you know, we have a culture that I think, as a whole, probably sees those people who, who break the rules as being heroes. There's a slight twist in some people's minds, and 20,000 people, 24,000 people is a lot, but in a country of 60 million, it's really, it's still yeah. a minority, isn't it? But our biggest selling daily newspaper is still running stories about Real Madrid six weeks they are, on. Though. So, of do they, they are. shoulder any responsibility for the transformation of this loser into some kind of uh, gallant warrior? As Nitin was saying, they're an industry. They sell us the, the stories that we want to read and we want to hear about, and we are always going to want to hear about things like this more than we're going to want to hear about exam results, you know? It is a drama. But not all the papers, not all the papers opera. are running with the stories. Mm -hmm. And The Sun, it, it hands out awards to police officers, and here we are celebrating a boat who just went around saying, I'm going to kill police officers. I, I know. I, well, I, they, I they don't have to run is, those stories. They could run any other story. It is it, a kind of possibly a, a red top versus a broadsheet kind of thing, I, I, would, I would suggest. Seeing the documentary last night, I actually thought that that was quite a reasoned documentary, quite yeah. objective, which actually condemned him through his own yeah. words. And it, I came away thinking nothing more than he was a sadistic bully who was, who was and pretty... You, you were not alone, because a chap called Gary Mills, who's posted on that Moti fan site I was talking about, he posted this this morning, as a Moti lover, I, I imagine this is how he speaks, as a Moti lover, I never thought I'd say this, maybe the programme was biased, but he'd come over as a thick, intimidating bully. <laughs> so uh, someone's learnt something from the documentary. Mm. The question is whether or not the media is somehow fanning the flames, persuading people to see Moti as a hero. Let's hear what you have to say. Kirsty. OK, on line two, we have Abigail. Abigail, good morning. Hello. Hello. Uh, so, are you a fan? Well, I'm not saying I'm a fan, I do. I'm just saying I absolutely feel quite sorry for this guy because everybody prejudges everybody in society whenever they do anything bad. Oh, he's done this. But the guy has lost everything. He's lost everything in his eyes. Why did he lose everything, everything, Abigail? Why did he lose everything? Right, he'd lost his two girls. Why did he lose oh, everything, supposedly, Abigail? Allegedly, some, a little window, the programme never went into it. A child had um, been attacked by him. Yes, often, and all his and partners felt there. intimidated and controlled, and he seemed to have no awareness of the fact that he intimidated and frightened people wherever he went. Well, maybe that was to do with, if you look back into his upbringing, He'd also been a child that had been bullied by his stepfather. Lots he of people get bullied by different. their stepfathers. Not everybody goes around gunning innocent people down. But, yeah, what about but, taking however, responsibility for his life as an adult? He's not a psychopath, the experts said in that show. Therefore, he's an adult. He should have taken responsibility for his past. He should deal with his issues and resolve them, rather than going around constantly blaming everybody else for the problems he brought upon himself. And how you can come on a TV show and make excuses for a man who bullied people, particularly women, I don't understand it, Abigail. Wake no. up, you know? Open your eyes. Yeah. Because we don't know what was really going on with that guy. He only knew. It. He only knew. It. I mean, the girl was so scared of him. She, she went. She went up to um, his the prison and said, "You know what? I've got a new fellow." When she knew he would do something. So why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just leave it alone? Well, I presume she She's... was rather hoping that he wouldn't come round and immediately I demand a relationship with her. I don't know. I think she was looking in his face. To be fair. I actually do, and I think if she knew he was like that, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even have said I it. think you should be watching ITV. Thanks for visiting us, though, Abigail. <laughs> Let's have another. We have Tony on line one. Uh, Tony, good morning. Yeah, good morning. How are you? <laughs> well, I was doing all right, actually, until our previous call, but you far away. What do you think, sir? Uh, well, um, no, what it is, I don't think it's particularly the press. But personally, I just think it's a, it's the state of the things as, as they are today. I mean, I think a lot of people have some sympathy for him. I don't condone murder or all this fan lark. I mean, it must be terrible for the, the 
chap who was uh, killed, you know, his family. But the thing is, I think a lot and the of women, people have and the women he repressed and, uh, and, well, and, and forced to stay at home and intimidated and all the other people that we heard about in the testimony in the yeah, documentary last night. Yeah, but don't you think he night? was mentally ill? Because I do. I think he needed help. I mean, you know, don't you think... He, uh, well, I just think he was mentally ill anyway. Well, I don't know, Tony. I, I think I he I needed you. help, you know. One of the things I was struck by was that, that his best friends, OK, blokes, not mentally ill, stringing a sentence together. His best friends continue to be best friends with a bloke who randomly ran around smacking his girlfriends about. Now, I don't know about you, but if I found out my best friend routinely smacked his girlfriend about whenever he didn't like something she did, or just because he was paranoid that she might be looking at some other bloke, I would break off in a relationship with that man. Well, or I would force him to seek help. Isn't that he needed help? I mean, wasn't he like a, he had a persecution complex? L listen, I'm not trying to make excuses for him. What Sounds I'm trying like to it. Say, what I'm trying to say is that I think there's a lot of working-class people, uh, especially white, to be honest with you, who feel very alienated in today's society. They've been abandoned sure they and not do. attacked by the politicians. And, and I think that's where he, he, he gets a bit but, of sympathy. But Tony, you know I mean? but Tony, 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 like Tony, what about the working-class women, right, that he brutalised? Yes. You know? Well, listen, I can't speak... About that, I'll tell you why, because I can't understand how anybody no, no, can do no, that you, you just... I agree with you, I totally agree with you there. You, but you just me... said he represents working class people, I'm right? Not saying so he what about the working class, class people? He represents he working class people. What I'm saying to you is there's a lot of people out there, working class white people, who feel totally abandoned by the political system. And, and there are working class women that were totally abandoned by other adults, yeah, I, other I working class people. Matthew, I don't condone that at all. It sounds you know, like you do, I don't condone Tony. any of that behaviour at all. All the violence. Uh, nobody's got a right to hurt other people or to take people. Do you know what? Life. That's what Raoul Moat used that. to say. But the thing is, the press's role in this, I don't think... I think the reason he's got some sympathy is because a lot of people feel like that. They feel totally... Uh, it's totally uh, abandoned and uh, alienated by today's but then, politics. But then they're ignoring... You know, people making saying decisions the... in, in, in the political elite. They're making decisions when all it means to them is to get a cleaner, cheaper, or a, uh, you know, a nanny a little bit cheaper. When it really people's lives in this country now, it's a big struggle for ordinary people. I, and I, this is something I, like most. I, I don't being disagree. Tony, and I think that's where it gets the sympathy. I don't disagree, but your view is to disregard the fact that Moat went around bullying not, and hurting other working class Matthew, people. I'm not disregarding anything. The thing is, all that says to me is how much he needed help. If he's hitting women, he's got big problems. If he's using violence like he has, he's got big problems. I mean, why wasn't it picked up by, by sort of psychiatrists? Why but wasn't it, he given was some, some sort of help? He obviously needed it. Uh, by no, I don't condone his actions at all. I mean, like I say, it must be terrible for them uh, the family who's uh, the chap who was killed and the, the, the policeman's family, it must be And the girlfriend, for them. entirely oh. innocent woman who was brutalised by him and then critically wounded. Yeah, you know? I don't understand that at all myself. But okay. all it says to me is how much he needed help. Tony, I, hold your piece if you don't mind. You want to get in, Steve? Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, actually, I'm hearing, hearing very much what you're saying there. Um, and he was given and offered help. He was a man who, who the system was very, very much aware of. Um, but he was so paranoid and so convinced that he was being persecuted, there was no way he could be given help. He was actually physically intimidating the people who were trying to help him, trying to provide support for him. He was actually saying, you know, that he considered the Northumbria police were deliberately trying to incite him to lose his rag so that they could arrest him. This was a man who had so much paranoia, he could not have been helped, I, I personally believe. Mm. Also, sorry, can I just say, I, I understand, Tony, what, 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 in reference, what you were trying to make a reference of, of, of this little aspect of society that's broken. There is an underclass, there is a, there is a working class that feel disenchanted with life. And, and the situation as it is in economical... Without a doubt, without a doubt. But it, you do not go around killing people. And the fact that the, there is this fan club is, I find, is, is that aspect of that little pocket of society where there is a certain kind of sickness to uh, revel in this guy's act when people are being murdered. Mm. Got to go to a break, I'm afraid.